Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today in my, um, in my father's homeland. Uh, as, a, as a Pole uh, living in San Francisco, to be here with you today is a real honor. And what I want to talk about today is the digital enlightenment, this unique moment in history we find ourselves. And specifically, I want to look at how talent and technology is giving birth to this fourth industrial revolution. Before I get into this, let me start with why. So, a personal story. So, my father was born in Poland here in 19, 1930. And uh, after the war, he, uh, he set up an adventure travel company uh, that was to take students overland to India in the 50s. And he was hitchhiking back and forth. And it was on a trip in 1958 that he contracted polio and ended up spending two years in hospital and the rest of his life in a wheelchair. At age 28, finding himself in, uh, with life in a wheelchair, he realized that people changed their expectations of him as, uh, and his own potential. And he realized actually that 10% of the world's population were physically handicapped in some fashion. And the vast majority of them didn't work. They didn't contribute actively to their communities. And he believed very strongly that a person can't have dignity or self-respect unless they can contribute proactively to their community, unless they, they work. So in the 60s, he managed to do a 100,000-mile expedition around the world to assess the situation of handicapped people and look at vocational employment, uh, vocational education training opportunities. And on that expedition, he set up a community in India to train handicapped people. And it's with that lens that I want to share with you this, this message today. Because my childhood home, every year from the age of nine, I would go to India to what's now one of the world's largest communities around disability and, and leprosy to uh, look at vocational training programs. And it was really that that inspired my own mission. And I'll say that there's a number of entrepreneurs here today, and we know about this, this notion of fa uh, product market fit, when, you, when your product's really sticking and getting zeitgeist. I would argue that before product market fit actually comes founder market fit. And I want to share with you this notion of why, why you as an individual are best placed to create this, this, this company that you're creating. So just on a personal note, uh, I'm founder and CEO of Brave New. Uh, we're a knowledge sharing collaboration platform that uh, helps organizations create learning communities. These are peer-to-peer -peer learning environments for companies like Lockheed Martin and GE based in San Francisco. So let's just start here with the welcome to the digital enlightenment, this unique moment in history that we've been hearing about today. We're really in a unique moment. The world has seen enlightenment periods before. This is not the first enlightenment period. In fact, when you look at the world from a, a context of history, it's actually the enlightenment periods that really define our world. Not all history mattered equally. It was actually just a series of moments that matter, that then shaped centuries following them, that bent the arc of history. And I think there's a lot we can learn from going back to history and looking at those previous enlightenment periods that defined our times. Think, think the time of Aristotle and, and Socrates and Plato and Alexander the Great. Think, think the time of the Medicis and da Vinci. Think the time of Isaac Newton and Shakespeare. When we look at these previous enlightenment periods, we notice a couple of things. One, they were geographically hyper-located. Place really mattered. They were taking place in Athens. They were taking place in Milan, in Florence, in London. They were the epicenters of the Enlightenment period. Number two, we see that the people that make up those Enlightenment periods somehow all knew each other. Have you noticed that? When you read in the history books, somehow da Vinci was hanging out with the other, with Michelangelo, and they were influencing each other. Jung and, and, and Freud. Think Paris in the 1920s. And so what can we learn about this Enlightenment period? About place. 
because I think it really matters for Poland in creating an ecosystem, a place, an epicenter of innovation. So the fourth industrial revolution, in my eyes, is a golden age. It's a golden age of opportunity. As entrepreneurs, we know that where there's change, there is opportunity. Some look at change as a threat. Others see opportunity. In fact, the Chinese symbol for danger and threat is exactly the same as opportunity. And I think it depends on your mindset. Do you have a scarcity mindset? Do you have a mindset driven by fear? Or do you have an abundant mindset? This will really, really shape your role in this, in this golden age. But this is not without challenges. We know that 50% of jobs are going to be automated by machines in the next 20 years. This is an age of massive turbulence, massive disruption. But there's a huge amount of opportunity, but I would say that it's so important that we remember our humanity. We cannot be slaves to the machine. We need to be, take proactive roles in how we define this digital age and this digital enlightenment. I would argue we've, the pendulum of history has swung too far towards individualism, and we need to kind of go back to history, back to the future, and back to our communities that really define our humanity and give us purpose. Because it's participating in our communities that really gives us a sense of purpose and a sense, sense of satisfaction. So there's often a debate of the future of capitalism. And I'd ask you today, do you believe the world has gone from capitalism now to talentism? Now, what I mean by that is the number one currency has gone from financial capital to human capital. And this is really the key message I want to leave with you today, that it's now talent that is driving the fourth industrial revolution. It's a people revolution. In fact, when we think about the greatest invention of humanity's history, the internet, access to the sum total of human knowledge, it's people that are going to apply that. And it's our creative capacity to apply that knowledge that, that is the opportunity. In fact, talent is king. That old thing we used to learn in school, that cash is king, actually is no longer. I believe very strongly that talent is king. What I mean by this is countries, cities, and companies are all living and dying by their ability to attract, retain, and develop talent. Countries and cities, if you think about what defines these places, it's their ability to keep their, their talent as well as develop them. I could find no better image than this one. This is the PayPal Mafia, which some of you might be familiar with. Between these founders of PayPal, they went on to create companies like LinkedIn, like, um, like YouTube, like SpaceX, like Tesla, and numerous venture funds, the first investor in Facebook. Just this small group of people, and we know the history books will include these people. But despite this, there's great opportunity because I would still advocate that human capital is the world's most wasted resource. And this is very relevant for Poland. Let's think about what is the gap between what you do today and what you could be doing if you were optimized to your fullest potential. And personally, I believe humans have got limit limitless potential. So what is that potential gap for you? the gap between what you do and what you could do. And when we think of this from a, from a global context, we hear a lot about wasting energy and wasting food, but actually we're grossly wasting our human capital. I believe that Poland, to have an edge, needs to invest in human capital. It needs to be a place to celebrate talent. Because the world is full of rough diamonds. People that have got great potential but due to circumstance and due to system failing, they never receive the polishing to ever achieve their potential. 
So just think, how many undiscovered Chopins are there in Poland right now? How many undiscovered Da Vinci's? How many undiscovered Elon Musk's are there here in Poland that we can really create systems and ecosystems to develop that talent? So I believe, personally, that the formal education system is broken. The formal education system was a product of the industrial age. It was designed as a conveyor belt to create and prepare people for factories. And it is no longer achieving its, its purpose. In fact, every year, the skills gap, the gap between demand on skills in industry and supply of skills graduating from uh, schools and colleges and universities around the world is growing. And here is the real opportunity. Education is what people do to you. Learning is what you do for yourself. And in an age of talent, and in an age of talentism, it's absolutely critical that we become lifelong learners. We need to redevelop this notion of the Renaissance man and woman. That this, we need to celebrate the intersection between these disciplines. And here's the data. This information revolution is happening. This is both the problem and of the, the opportunity. You can see here this graph going up. In, in 1900, the world would double its information every 150 years. Right now, the world is doubling. In 2010, the world is doubling its information every three years. By 2020, we're doubling the world's information every two months. That's unprecedented. This is not linear change. This is exponential change, which requires a completely different way of thinking and approaching knowledge. And it's going to be those companies that have the edge. I believe all of you today, and myself included, as knowledge workers, we're suffering information overload. It's hard to keep up. We all get too many emails, I'm sure. So we need to think about our collective impact. I think we, we're all familiar with the Big Bang, this creation of every atom that we have in the universe that happened in a single moment. I believe with the creation of the internet, we've created the Bit Bang. But this one is happening so much faster. Just think what's happened in the last, the last 20 years. It's an explosion, and we know that, we know that cats are what keeps the interwebs up. <laughs> so the, the half-life of knowledge now, on average, is seven years. So in the past, when our parents graduated, it was quite common for them to be able to apply that same knowledge throughout their career. Now we need to be constant learners. We need to be lifelong learners. And this notion that you're either in education or in employment is no longer. In fact, we need to be in both constantly. Because the ecosystems matter. In the knowledge economy, collaboration is the number one currency. Our ability to tap into our collective wisdom. Because right now, we've been very, very good at creating silos. In fact, silos cost the enterprise $260 billion a year. And just like the military, this, 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 this um, Stan McChrystal, the general, that led, uh, led, led, led the Iraq, uh, Iraq war, said that actually every military in the past was set up in a command and control fashion, created these silos where knowledge was power. But actually now, with the insurgency, they had to completely change that to create these knowledge ecosystems where actually sharing knowledge is power. And that's a real question to you, to both your businesses, to the ecosystems you participate in, to the companies here, and the government. How are you creating a culture of going from knowledge is power to sharing knowledge is power, and creating these knowledge ecosystems? Because I really believe this is at the heart of every entrepreneurial ecosystem, tapping into that collective wisdom. Now, there's two books that some of you may have read. Um, Thomas Friedman, The World is Flat. He made this very powerful argument that actually now, the, uh, unlike it, 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 through history, that opportunity uh, is everywhere. 
And it doesn't matter if you're in Timbuktu because you can participate through Amazon's Mechanical Turk, the largest workforce in the world. You can participate in the digital economy. But actually there's this other author, Richard Florida, that said actually the world is not flat. The world is spiky. I tend to agree with him. It matters where you are located. There are hubs of talent around the world, Silicon Valley being one for the digital enlightenment, London being another, Krakow being one. Think of the history here, the, the foundation of one of the world's oldest universities. Krakow has always been a spike of talent. How do we celebrate that spike? How do we attract these ecosystems? How do we consciously create these spikes? That's the opportunity. Because talent attracts talent. When you look at companies like Netflix, like Google, like Facebook, one of the major reasons people work there is because of the other people that work there. A players want to work with A players. B players want to work with C players. So it's so important that we fill our companies, that we develop our cities that we develop these ecosystems because talent attracts talent. And this is my major message. What, how can Poland really become that talent hub? Because you're doing a great job of it already, but how can we celebrate that to really embrace lifelong learning? And together, and I emphasize together, we can build this collective potential movement. This is different to the human potential movement that happened in the 1960s. The human potential movement was driven by individuals, driven by individualism. It didn't have the infrastructure to really become a global phenomenon. Now, because of the internet, we can all participate and we can create this collective potential movement where we go from I to we, when we go from you to yes, all of us together. And let me finish with you my favorite entrepreneur quote. Dreams are not what I have in my sleep. They are what prevent me from sleeping. Thank you so much for listening to me. Take care.